Greetings and welcome everybody to a new video and book reading of the book by P.D. Stewart, Code Word Barbalon, 666 Danger in the Vatican. Today is December 22nd, 2017, and I would like to introduce my dear friend and brother in Christ, Jörg Glissman of Belgium. Jörg, how are you doing today? I'm fine, thanks, and uh, glad to be back, and uh, even wonderful that after the recording of yesterday we are able to do another broadcast today on the book because you know it is uh, 500 and some pages and it will take us some time to go through it and I just can't await giving all this information uh, to the people and I'm sorry dear listener mm -hmm. that I left you yesterday sitting on the tip of your chair when I announced that the story which I will now relate were my latest words, but those therefore will be my first words today. When we retreat to the book and go back to the book and read on the bottom of page 22, which we are going to do in a moment, but not right now. For the moment, I'm going to send uh, on Skype to Brett a link on the, uh, on the internet that I hope he clicks on. Yep. And when Got he it. clicks on it, there will open a document from a website that is actually not available anymore since some years. Mm. It, is, it is the website of uh, who many people of you maybe know and many do not know, uh, Daryl Eberhardt. He often was a guest on Inquisition Update in the years 2010, at least. Uh, in, in that year he was there several times. I listened to him and I think also 2009. But uh, Daryl Eberhardt has lost his website, and I'm not even going into that. Uh, you can do your own research on that stuff. You can go to Inquisition Updates uh, web page and uh, see there there are some information about Daryl Eberhardt or listen to the archives of First Amendment Radio 2009 and 2010 and see what Tom has to say about Daryl Eberhardt, who e even took some of the broadcasts of um, Inquisition update over when Tom had uh, other things to attend to and anyway this website was gone and uh, I uploaded a video some time ago I don't know what it was anymore and uh, mentioned something of Daryl Eberhardt and somebody put this website link on there and this is a recovery of his website mm. and therefore we have this website which is called toughissues.org and um, we have it again and I opened this today on a page that I want to read to you at first as a little introduction because you know the book Cold World Babylon deals with the sons of Loyola and their plans for world domination their plans for world domination in order to have the world they of course first need to have the United States of America because the United States of America is the policeman of the world and for the people who are stipped in biblical prophecy who uh, know exactly that the United States of America a little bit to their detriment that they have to uh, be sure of that but that's the case is the second beast of Revelation 13 and I'm not going into all the Jesuit involvement of founding the United States of America that would be a whole other broadcast and even more than one broadcast I touched on that while I was reading the book Rulers of Evil and even in later times, when I did On Hour of the Truth and the time with Walt Stickel, we were all over the carols and their involvement. And there is so much more to say when you read the book The Ark and the Dove, which Brett some weeks ago even purchased. Um, mm -hmm. Because when you read the third book, of, or the third part of the book, The, uh, the, uh, the Ark and the Dove, and you lay rulers of evil next to it, you will have an understanding, a historical understanding of the founding of the United States of America as you have never had before. So I can only advise you, again, to do your own research. This is so important, people. This is what led me to the site that I'm just reading to you. I, okay, before this broadcast started, I took five minutes and I read this little page because I wanted to know, doesn't this take not take too much time of the time that we have planned to use the book Cold World Babylon, which is already a wonderful and big work and time-consuming work in itself. But I have to read this to you because this is important. It deals with the Canadian author and professional actor C.T. Wilcox, who has written a book that deals with the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln. 
Yeah? This book is called The Transformation of the Republic, The Origins of the Religious Hijacking of the American Government and the Truth Behind the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Daryl Eberhardt posted this in 2006 and uh, the reason that he did that was that C.T. Wilcox to, uh, to, uh, took $10 off the price of the book. At that time it was available for $29.99 plus shipping and handling. And you can go to the links uh, when Brett will of course put the link of the website that I'm reading to you in a moment into the description box of this video. And you mm -hmm. can get the book for yourself and you can make up your own mind and do your own studies on this. But because this book deals with the transformation of the Republic, well, Revelation 13 tells us that the second beast of Revelation 13 started as a lamb, a Christ-like nation, and then it spake as a dragon. That is a transformation. That is the transformation of the Republic, and that's why I want to read this to you. But before I start, do you have any comments on anything that I, s I said so far, Brad? Do you want to contribute something? Sure, sure, Jörg. Uh, there is another book here. I'm looking around really quickly, and uh, I have it somewhere here by C.T. Wilcox of um, uh, something about the same... Uh, topic, but a different title. It's a more modern version of that. And I have that book here somewhere. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I have to find it. I don't have it in front of me <laughs> right now, so please forgive me for not having that title in front of me. <laughs> but I did buy a book by C.T. Wilcox, and... Um, Ah, oh, it's just, you know, when am I ever going to get the time to read all these wonderful books? I'm not sure. Well, got to make time. Whenever you're you going to get the time to clean up your house a little bit that you find the books you are looking for. <laughs> <laughs> I'm oh, sorry, I, I had to say that's that. That's <laughs> all right. That's all right. You know, that's what I was telling you earlier today. That's kind of the, the flip side of being a creative person is that you – create these little quote-unquote messes and in these little messes to an outsider look you know they look like oh, how can you deal with this you know but to someone that actually knows where things are at usually you know th the things that I am working on at the moment let's just say that are usually right on the surface right within my reach and uh, that's kind of how it works so you know, you take the good with the bad. <laughs> <laughs> so please go ahead and read. I'm all ears. Okay, so I'm going to read what's on this web page. And it starts here that the back cover of this book from C.T. Wilcox states the following quote. In the entire history of political assassination plots by the enemies of freedom, none can exceed the cruel murder of Abraham Lincoln. U.S. President Lincoln was the triumphant embodiment of the new concept of representative government, the central postulate of which is the consent of the governed. Was John Wilkes Booth a Jesuit patsy, hired to do the dirty work for the Roman Catholic Church, whose plan a well-kept secret unto now was to transform the United States Republic into a theocratic, monarchical-type dictatorship? Good question. When you think about it, the United States of America has been ruled since the early 30s of last century by almost all the time by executive orders. Isn't that a monarchical type of dictatorship? Of course, you are told that you have elections every five or four years or whatever, and you can elect a quote-unquote president. Yeah, you can elect one of the puppets that they put in front of you, but do you really elect something, or are you just confirming selected actors? That's the question you have to ask yourself. A theocratic, monarchical type dictatorship? Well, the monarchical type of dictatorship you have with presidents who rule by executive orders. And theocratic, well, when the church, when the spiritual power is above the civil power, you have a theocratic monarchical type dictatorship. Who rules the United States of America? The civil power or the spiritual power? 
that's maybe something for another day to discuss. But on the back side of the book it continues here. In 1814 Pope Pius VII, who was Pope between 1800 and 1823, restored the Society of Jesus, which had been abolished by Antichrist Pope Clement XIV on July 21st, 1773, on the grounds that it was immoral, it was dangerous, the Society of Jesus was a menace to the life of the papacy. And Clement XIV was promptly poisoned for this act, within 14 months after the suppressing of his order, and he knew that he would die. Now, the book continues, the transformation of the Republic presents fully documented evidence that the Church of Rome, through the religious, political and financial power of the Jesuit order, one day plans to rule over all nations from Jerusalem and eliminate any opposition to her design. Now, the undertitle of Cold World Babylon is The Sons of Loyola and Their Plans for World Domination. What do we just read here on the back of C.T. Wilcox's book, The Transformation of the Republic? This book presents fully documented evidence that the Church of Rome, through religious, political and financial power of the Jesuit order, one day plans to rule over all nations from Jerusalem and eliminate any opposition to her designs. This book yeah. says exactly what, uh, what uh, P.D. Stewart's book a hundred years later said. Yeah, yeah. wow. And, and uh, here the news of uh, our wonderful... President Trump these last few days, uh, giving the, the green light to uh, the world that we're going to accept Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Yeah. Also, yeah. It, all, it all plays in there that, it sure eventually, does. that eventually the Antichrist, and that is the Pope of Rome, will rule from Jerusalem. He always wanted to have Jerusalem. But yes, even and very instrumental is, is our country, the United States of America, who makes the whole world worship the first beast, yeah. right? As, as said in, in the scriptures. That's right. And it is very important that we understand this little summation that I read to you here. Through mm -hmm. the religious, political, and financial power of the Jesuit order. Now, what is the religious, political, and financial power of the Jesuit order, you may ask? This is manifested in the world through most and for all the Knights of Malta, who are in all top positions of all international or globalized economic elephants, I, know, uh, I call them, the big mm -hmm. companies, the international companies, who globalize everything, who usurp all the small countries and take care of, that the middle class will vanish a middle class that is the achievement of the Reformation, and there they have that goal. So they control through their papal powers, the Jesuit order, the economics, they control the political realm, they control the financial realm, because the um, Federal Reserve Bank of the United States of America is actually owned by the Knights of Malta. It was from the beginning. No, this is not something that you read when you look into Eustace Mullins and all these other people who are speaking about uh, the, the monster of Jekyll Island and all that stuff. There you will never see the Jesuit order mentioned. But that's because those people are disinformation agents and don't tell you the plain truth. And the plain truth is that Rome still rules today. Rome ruled in the time of Jesus Christ and Rome rules still today, 2000 years after. Jesus Christ walked on the earth. Mm -hmm. And it will That's rule right. until Jesus Christ comes back. Huh? That's right. So, And you can turn to Revelation, the latter half of uh, Revelation 18, and it describes the merchants of the earth. And uh, I believe uh, verse 23, the yes. end of verse 23, for thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by their sorceries were all nations deceived, unquote. Yeah, that's right, Brett. Thank yeah. you for bringing that up. That is absolutely You're very correct. welcome. That was really on my mind last night, so <laughs> it's imperfect. 
Okay, so I'm going to continue what's on the back of the book from C.T. Wilcox here. To accomplish this goal, it will use the military arms of suitable, pliable nations. After the found and, and what are suitable, pliable nations? I'm just going to tell you what those are. For example, NATO nations, yeah, North Atlantic uh, Treaty Organization, yeah, the quote unquote Western Hemisphere Defense. Uh, company they put up uh, in the 1950s, all with suitable pliable nations who will do the bidding of the United States. When the United States says you go in here and you put your soldiers in there, they do. And if they don't, there's going to be a regime change in the countries who don't apply to that. After the founding of the Americas, Jesuit infiltration to the United States was part of a careful planned long-term strategy to overthrow the fledgling New World governments. Yeah? Um, this is another very important sentence. I actually, I just wanted to read this and didn't want to go into too much of explanation, but here and there I can't help it to help you a little bit. It says here, after the founding of the Americas, Jesuit infiltration to the United States was part of a careful planned long-term strategy. Well, there is one word not correct in the sentence, and that is the, in, uh, the Jesuit infiltration to the United States. The Jesuits didn't infiltrate the, uh, the United States. The Jesuits infiltrated the colonies and made the colonies rebel against Protestant England. They needed a separation of the colonies from Protestant England because they couldn't get England to the, do the bidding of the Pope, not with the Spanish Armada, not with the Babington plot, not with the um, gunpowder plot of 1605. They just couldn't get England back under the wings of Rome. So they needed to separate the colonies from Protestant England and they did that by infiltrating the colonies from the beginning of the 17th century, even from the start of the 16th century, they mm -hmm. already put Jesuits over there in the colonies. And therefore, you need to read and understand the book, The Ark and the Dove. That's exactly what I was thinking, too. <laughs> and Wow. You know... It is easy to sit here on the computer and read these sentences, but you have to understand it and you also have to find the mistakes in there. Yes. Uh, nobody is perfect. And no. even C.T. Wilcox or whoever wrote the spec cover of the book was not perfect when he speaks of Jesuit infiltration. It was no infiltration. People, if you believe me or not, I don't care, but it's the truth. The Jesuits mm -hmm. founded the United States of America. That's why they were thrown out of every country in the world and never out of the United States of America. It is their country. You maybe don't like it, but that's the truth. And when you study real true history, you will see that it is the truth. The Jesuits founded the United States of America. They founded the government of the United States of America. They That's right. Not the spiritual power, but the political power. They are always standing for a top-down government. And the people, the inhabitants of the United States, were given the impression that they will have a... Uh, how do you call that? A, um, mm -hmm. a government from bottom to top but actually they are having a top-to-bottom government. A right. A white is government. black, and black is white. Yeah. But just like our Roman Catholic hierarchy tells us, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it, just, it just appears for the people in another way, but yeah. that's not the way that it is. Not everything is right. as it appears, you know? It's a facade. It's a facade, yeah. And the people were, well, you know, giving the security, oh, well, but you have religious freedom. Yes. No, the Protestant inhabitants of the United States of America gave up their religious freedom the moment religious freedom was written into the Constitution, which only gave freedom to Roman Catholics to practice their idolatrous and superstitious religion along with Protestant uh, worship in the United States of America. All of a sudden, Roman Catholics were not outcasts anymore. But anyway, yep. this is going, That's this right. is going too deep. And, and you yeah. really have to study that history to learn that, too. It, it just, if you don't ever look at the history, 
behind it, then you're just going to sit there and uh, be confused about it, you know, because the history really clears it up. Mm hmm. Please. Okay, I, I, I really don't want to go too deep into this. I, I just want to bring this to an end and read to you a little bit more from the back of the book from C.T. Wilcox on the uh, transformation of the Republic. It continues here to say, Until now, the Roman Catholic cabal had successfully buried all evidence of this plot, meaning the assassination of uh, Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. With prodigious research and detective work, Canadian author C.T. Wilcox has unearthed and pieced together the details of the motivating factors of the U.S. Civil War, the Lincoln assassination, the trials which ensued, and what the designs that were laid during this period means for us today, even today in 2017. Wilcox has included several original documents and many others that are quoted verbatim. Now here follow a couple of quotes from this excellent book. In 1822, at the secret meetings at Verona in Italy, the Roman Catholic monarchies of Europe conspired, together with the Vatican, to destroy the concept of popular government as found in the experiment of the United States by means of infiltration, subversion and corruption. The tools used were the Leopold Foundation, which was set up by Prince Metternich of Austria and the Jesuit Order. The purpose being to use the financial and military arms of the United States to further the interests of the papacy in its goal of putting all the world under the temporal submission of the Roman Catholic Church. Unquote. Now, Please don't misunderstand me. I can, uh, I can elaborate on this little quote that I've just read to you for several hours. I mm -hmm. won't go into that. But when you are interested in a deeper analysis of this little page that I'm reading right now, then please write that in the comment section of the video when Brett or I upload this on our channels. And then we will pursue that and go deeper into it. But now, today, is not the time. I beg you to understand, but I hope that I kindled your interest in staying on the screen, listening to what I have to say and what Brett has to say about the Jesuits today. Another mm -hmm. quote. The Jesuits killed President Lincoln and buried the evidence. Now, here are some more quotes of the book. The American Civil War from 1861 through 65 was not a homespun affair. It was the result of the same upheavals that have changed the face of Europe. The promises and active help of the European empires and the Church of Rome along with the Jesuit order had stiffened the resolve and attitude of the southern or meaning confederate leaders, some of whom were quite willing to see the monarchic principle triumph in North America. That is taken from page 8. The Jesuit order is an assassination of highly organized warrior priests. Don't forget, the Jesuit order had been founded by the papal bull Regimini Militantis Ecclesiae. It is a military organization. It is not a normal monastic order. They are politicians first with their allegiance to the Pope of Rome, and foremost and have been expelled from virtually every country they have had the opportunity to corrupt and destroy. Their modus operandi, means their terms of operation, is political and educational infiltration and subversion and the fomenting of wars and revolutions in order to weaken and mold the target country into submissive pliability, to then be used to carry out their purpose of global ecclesiastically backed dictatorship. The United States, I'm sorry to say, is no exception to this. This is a quote from page 8. It is well known, another quote continues, that there were over 2,000 members of the Jesuit order located in Washington DC in the years prior to the year 1900. That's 117 years ago. 
2,000 members, over 2,000 members, in the last 100 plus years. This number is anyone's guess, but the reader can be assured that it has increased significantly and with it the political influence it wields. A quote from page 341. And with that, I'm done with this intro of the book, of, of uh, not the book, but of uh, informing you on the book The Transformation of the Republic by C.T. Wilcox that you can get on the internet. And uh, after Brett had maybe a little bit to say, we are going to continue on the bottom of page 22 in Code Word Babylon. Mm, yeah, all I got to say is I wish I had that book in front of me. It might be the same book. I just can't remember. <laughs> so uh, I, I thought I remembered a different title, though. I know it's it's close. So I'm only aware of the transformation of the Republic that he wrote. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. So I might actually have that book. So oh no, it's the perverting of the promised land. That's what it is by C. T. Wilcox. The perverting oh. of the promised land. I finally remembered. <laughs> the sun's <laughs> coming out and it's shining right on me. That's why. All right. Oh. Perfect. Okay, I'm living in total darkness here already. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Ten o'clock in the evening. But well, sometimes Sabbath. it just takes it's, that it's, little... It's Sabbath. It's Friday after sunset, so it is Sabbath, and there's yes, no better right. thing to do than uh, do a Bible study and yes. uh, histo history study on the Sabbath day. That's right. And to get more acquainted with the word of our Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, in the last but one paragraph on page 22, I will continue reading in the book of uh, P.D. Stewart. And please, Brett, as always, when you have something to say, then uh, interrupt me with a comment and uh, then yes. also you, you can uh, give your input into the reading here. Okay, I'm ready. They faced further scandal in 1761 due to the now famous Lavalette Law suit of 1759. This new episode of Jesuit intrigue brought about the bankruptcy of the French Jesuit father Lavalette and exposed the inner workings of the Jesuit order, which story I will now relate to you. And at least today we are going to start with that relation. Père Antoine Lavalette was the Jesuit procurator in the, uh, in the island of Martinique, a French colony of the Lesser Antilles, who had previously engaged in large-scale international trade with good results. The record, uh, the record says that Lavalette had, quote, organized offices in Santo Domingo, Granada, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and other islands, and drew bills of exchange on Paris, London, Bordeaux, Nantes, Lyon, Cadiz, Leghorn, and Amsterdam, unquote. His vessels loaded with riches comprising of, besides colonial produce, Negro slaves, crossed the sea continually. Now, this is very interesting that we learn that Lavalette also dealt with Negro slaves, because there we see that the whole slave trade, of course, was under the control by the Jesuit order from the beginning. You just have to do your own studies in that. Encouraged by these successes, Lavalette borrowed heavily, two to three million francs at the time, from bankers in Marseille, and tried his, uh, tried his hand at a boom-or-bust scheme. Yeah, it probably bust, right? It mm. failed miserably. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me, too. Yeah. It failed miserably. This was because, as fate and providence would have it, Providence means the hand of God intervening. The vessels bearing his merchandise were seized at a sea by the English Navy in 1755. Lavalette was, in consequence of this, unable to pay his creditors and was sued in the celebrated case of Gouffre M. Leonchi versus Father Lavalette. It was the Jesuits' undoing in France but not for the reason you might think. When I, P.D. Stewart, visited Rome in 2003, there stood a marble figure adorning one of the great halls of the Vatican in St. Peter's Basilica, 
Looking down serenely over passers-by was the statue of a monk, Ignatius de Loyola, holding up, uh, holding open a copy of the Constitutions. His finger pointing to a page on which the inscription reads "Ad majorem die gloriam." This means in English "for the greater glory of God." This said Constitution was the cause of their undoing in France, and it is still, to this day, the source of all their Machiavellian graces, the spring from which flow all their arrogations and enormous abuses. The Jesuits have continued to dispute the authenticity of the Secreta Monita, so let us look at them through their own lens, the constitutions of the Society of Jesus. Now comes a very important sentence, because I mark this here, or little paragraph. There we shall see, in the constitutions of the Jesuits, that the Jesuits' aim is to subjugate all governments to the government of the Pope. What did we just read in C.T. Wilcox's book? You remember? to have the governments of the nations run according to the agenda of the Holy See. We shall see, too, that Rome is a great machine, the master key of which are the Jesuits. If they fall, the papacy will crumble into ruins. That is all I will say for now. In the coming chapters I shall assert nothing without proof, nor will I assume anything on doubtful authority. Rather, I shall fortify the facts presented with the best evidence and shall proceed step by step using the highest and most incontestable proofs. I will now let others speak. And here we go into chapter 2, the constitutions of the Jesuits. It starts with the Persian proverb that reads, The ravens have ascended to the nests of the nightingales. And the other one is a Latin uh, proverb that says Tempore pact occulta malum execrabile vaticanium means time brings to light hidden evil the cursed prophecy comes true. Ugh, scary. <laughs> Yeah, right. that's uh, pretty heavy duty, wasn't it? Uh, um, I have a video on my channel of uh, ex-Jesuit priest and uh, author um, ha, Alberto Rivera, mm -hmm. who states that the uh, the Latin language is the language of Antichrist. How fitting! Sure, it is. It's the dead language of Rome. Mm-hmm. It is. And that's the language of the Antichrist, because the Antichrist is the papacy in Rome. Mm-hmm. Okay, C.T. Wilcox starts here, and uh, sometimes I have to look into the footnotes and to see if these footnotes are important to read, because some footnotes are, and some footnotes are just sources, and uh, therefore you can do your own research, read the book on yourself, and track down the um, footnotes and the sources if they are correct. I did that as far as it is possible already. So I will just continue now reading this second chapter, the Constitutions of the Jesuits. The ravens have ascended to the nests of the nightingales. I cannot discover, wrote the French famous lawyer La Chatelet, himself educated by the Jesuits, that the constitutions of the Jesuits have ever been seen or examined by any tribunal whatsoever, secular or ecclesiastic, by any sovereign, not even by the court of chancery of Prague, when permission was asked to print them. They have taken all sorts of precautions to keep them a secret." Unquote. The most well-known Jesuit motto is Ad Majorem Dei Gloriam means for the greater glory of God, as we've just learned the page before. This phrase, one Jesuit says, secures Rome, uh, secures some 259 times in the constitutions penned by Loyola. 
Another Jesuit, the biographer of Ignatius Loyola, Dominique Bouhour, called the Constitutions a revelation from God and an inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Here, of course, we have to understand that we are dealing with the Roman Catholic Church, the Church of Satan, and when they say a revelation from God, it's a revelation from Satan and an inspiration of the Holy Spirit that is not the Holy Spirit of the Bible. You always have to remind yourself of this when you hear me reading words like these. Thus, the Constitutions came to be seen by the Jesuits as having absolute authority, absolute authority over every member of the Order. This secret document is, in a manner of speaking, the mission statement of the Society of Jesus. But now, reader, suppose we were to ask them to see these constitutions to look inside. They will not produce it. In Regulare Societatis Jesu, Volume 2 of 1827, paragraph 26, we read, quote, No one, no one can tell to persons outside what is done or to be done in the house, mean the novitiate. Nobody can show them the constitutions or other documents of that kind or any other written material about the rules or privileges of the Society of Jesus without permission by the Superior General, the Black Pope. Thankfully, we now know what it contains. And what principles do we find therein? What godly virtues do they contain? Dear reader, of this monstrosity of the Jesuits none should be ignorant. It was aptly described by the French Parliament as a, quote, collection of dangerous and pernicious teachings and precepts taught by the Jesuits with the approbation of their superiors, unquote, and of every Pope since 1540. That is the ordination of the Jesuit order by Antichrist Pope Paul III. The constitutions provide for a highly centralized form of authority with life tenure for the head of the order, who the Jesuits call the Grey Eminence or the Black Pope. Hence, the Jesuits are referred to as the Black Militia, for reasons that will soon become apparent. The constitutions place particular emphasis on the virtues of obedience to superiors and special obedience to the Pope. One of its cardinal motto, as given by Ignatius, is perende axi cadaver eset, to have no mind of one's own, but to be like a dead body in the service of the general or the black pope. In Germany we have a word for that, and that is cadaver gehorsam. Cadaver is a word that you have in English too. Mm -hmm. And it is the obedience of a cadaver. That is the German word meaning. And that is the expression meaning Pirende axi cadaver eset. It means being obedient as a cadaver. Being the stick, like the stick in the hand of an old man who can use it for his own purpose as he wishes. And that is every Jesuit who has taken the vow and by that stepped into the society of Jesus. On the next page, on page 26, we find a picture of this uh, statue that is in the Vatican, where Ignatius of Loyola holds the Jesuit motto, Ad Maiorem Dei Gloriam, for the greater glory of God, that is written on the right hand of the book, and on the other hand, it, is, it says, Constitutiones Societas Jesu, so, this is even to be found in the Vatican like this. There is no doubt, dear listener, there is no doubt that these constitutions are of the Jesuits, because you even have a stone statue in St. Peter's Basilica holding a book wherein it is written, Ad Maiorem Dei Gloriam Constitutiones Societates Jesu. This mm -hmm. is not conspiracy theory. This is facts on the ground. Whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. William Russell writes, the Jesuits are, quote, a 
cho as chosen soldiers of the Pope under the command of a general. This general, or head of the order, was invested with despotic authority over its members. Unquote. And he adds, they are required by the constitutions and the Secreta Monita to attend to the transactions of the great of the world, to study the dispositions of persons in power and to cultivate their friendship. Like the Monita, the constitutions require every Jesuit to regard the interest of the order as his principal object, to which all other considerations were to be sacrificed, as it was for the honor and advantage of the society, meaning the order of Jesuits, that its members should possess an ascendant uh, over persons of rank and power. James Broderick comments, quote, In the constitutions of his order, St. Ignatius laid it down that each of his sons ought to have a keen eye for the unconsidered trifles of life. The constitutions gave the general immense power. The French lawyer La Chatelet gives us insight into the ultra-fascist nature of the Society of Jesus and the power of its general. Quote, the general of the Jesuit order is invested with control over every aspect of the government and regulation of the colleges of the society. From his orders there is no appeal. Not even the Pope himself can rescind the general's interdict. Not only is he able to release from vows, he is also empowered to examine, by every means, into the consciences of the members of the society. In short, the general is the society. To ensure utmost secrecy, the constitutions of the Sons of Loyola direct that the provincials and superiors shall write to the society's general in cipher, such precautions being taken against enemies, says the French lawyer M. de la Châtelet, who are their enemies and why they need to write in cipher. Before sketching an outline, which is all that space would allow, of how the constitutions came to be discovered by their enemies, it is instructive to read the words of an impartial commentator. Referring to these sons of Ignatius Loyola, Professor S. F. B. Morse, the inventor of the Morse code, remind you, wrote the following, quote, And who are these agents? They are the Jesuits, an ecclesiastical order proverbial through the world of cunning, duplicity and total want of moral principle, an order so skilled in all the arts of deception that even in Catholic countries, in Italy itself, it became intolerable." Unquote. Why did Professor Morse, the famous inventor of the Morse Code and a close friend to President Lincoln, speak so, ha so balefully of the Jesuits? To answer this question, we must return to the cause of Father Lavalette's undoing, the aforementioned French lawsuit against the Jesuits. As stated earlier, Jesuit Father Père Antoine Lavalette had borrowed heavily from businessmen in France, but his ambitious commercial venture failed at sea. Being unable to pay the debt he had incurred, Lavalette's creditors sent, uh, sued him and the Jesuit order in the French courts, and won. Their victory, some would say, was an act of God, Digitus Dei, in that the wide-ranging geopolitical plans of the Society of Jesus were, for the very first time, brought before the eyes of men. Now the world had some light and proof of the true purpose, the true purpose of this great secret society. All of France was stunned. The reputation of the society was left in tatters, destroyed, the Jesuits were brought to disgrace and lost their case. But watch closely how this drama unfolded. Having lost the argument in the provincial court in the Paris lawsuit of 1760, the lawyer of the Society of Jesus appealed to the French Parliament. After much argument back and forth, the Jesuits having made several pleas, 
all of which they were later forced to abandon as hopeless. They prayed and ate one final desperate defense, that the order could not be held liable for Lavalette's actions, as he was a renegade, because, according to the defense, all Jesuits were positively prohibited from engaging in commercial ventures. In this they committed a most serious blunder. They made reverence to their own constitutions as the source of this prohibition. Not only was this defense a desperate one, it was later proved a most flagrant fraud. In fact, quite soon after their formation in the 1540s, the Jesuits had obtained a special license from the court of Rome under Antichrist Pope Paul III to trade with the nations which they labored to convert. Moreover, it was well known that the Jesuits would trade on credit and profess to give the property of the society as security for their commercial debts. In many instances, their methods of business were most abnormal. Treaties and rules of commerce obeyed by all other merchants the Jesuits totally disregarded. Returning to Lavalette's trial. In seeking to use their constitutions as a shield, the Jesuits exposed their Achilles heel. The French court demanded to see the set constitutions upon which the Jesuits sought to make their defense against the lawful claims of Lavalette's creditors. This created an impasse, and the Jesuits refused to disclose the constitutions, and, as a result, the financial scandal almost brought many in France to bankruptcy. The French Parliament, to whom they had appealed, ordered the documents, meaning the constitutions, to be produced. The French Parliament ordered the constitutions to be produced. Until then the Jesuits had kept them secret, even from many of their own members. You know, need mm. to know basis. The mm. Jesuits being a secret society, not publishing their rules. The Jesuit Father Montigny was the poor soul to whom the society gave the unpalatable task of delivering the two volumes of their constitutions, 1757 edition, into the hands of the royal prosecutor, general for the parliament, the celebrated lawyer M. de la Chalotois. The renowned Dr. William Robertson says, quote, it was a fundamental maxim with the Jesuits, from their first institution, not to publish the rules of their order. These they kept concealed as an impenetrable mystery. They never communicated them to strangers, nor even to the greater part of their own members. They even refused to produce them when required by courts of justice. The constitutions were preserved only in handwritten manuscripts and allowed only to a few select members of the society, and when the two volumes finally were printed, they were not for the public. And Griesinger, <laughs> here we come up with a name, dear listener and viewer of the video. Griesinger wrote a book on the Jesuit order in German and in English in 1866. And I'm going to read that book on my channel sooner or later. I will start that in German probably in the next few weeks when I have my new computer and can do this reading. But it's in fracture writing. It's in this old, uh, in this old handwriting. Very hard to read, but I'm going to take the task on me and going to read that book in German and later on I will probably also read that in English. Theodor Griesinger, look him up if you want to and uh, get the information out there and the book of Griesinger about the Jesuits and their organization is available free on the internet as a PDF for the moment. So P.D. Stewart writes here, and Griesinger tells us, in that book of course, it's, um, I don't know, uh, The Jesuits, A Complete History of Their Open and Secret Proceedings, on page 473. That's the title of the book in English. 
and the German book uh, is entitled, let me just see, I have it here, Die Jesuiten vollständige Geschichte ihrer offenen und geheimen Wirksamkeit. So that's the German title and the English title I just read to you. Griesinger tells us that, quote, besides the society itself, no one, with the exception of the Pope, was made acquainted, and still less did mankind in general know how the original statutes, meaning the constitutions, and rules of the order had been further added to by the later, uh, uh, added to by the later generals, lest on this account the world should be thrown into a severe panic by becoming acquainted with the contents of their constitutions, rules and principles. Unquote from Griesinger. And so, but for Lavalette's blunder, as Providence would have it, God would have it that Lavalette went bankrupt and was brought before court by his creditors, that was divine intervention, the world may never have known of its existence. At this point, I beg leave to remind the reader that every one of the statements that uh, every one of the statements that follow in quotation marks are extracted from authenticated manuscripts, many taken from the writings of the Jesuits themselves, and which were all verified and collated by the commissioners and lawyers of the French Parliament. You see how very well researched this book is. There is no room for conspiracy theory. Having been forced to produce the documents, the constitutions were laid before Parliament on April 16, 1761. Quote, the result, we are told, was disastrous for the Jesuits. Unquote. They lost their cause, or case, and became much more odious than before. For the first time the world saw the Jesuits through their own eyes as revealed in the constitutions, and my, what a revelation it was! The disclosure revealed Jesuitism to men as an organization based on the most iniquitous maxims and armed with the most terrible weapons for the accomplishment of their object. Complete and utter world domination. How quickly, observed Griesinger, they made haste to destroy by fire all copies of the same as far as it was possible to get hold of them. But they soon became convinced, to their most profound grief, that they had been too late with all these measures." Unquote. The statements and teachings of the Jesuits, as extracted from their own constitutions, were collected and presented to the King of France in a document titled Arrêt du Parlement de Bretagne du 23 décembre uh, 1780, uh, 1761 and May 1762. So <laughs> I'm going to read mm. this in English. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. means the arrest of the Parliament of, Bre uh, of Bretagne. Um, the 23rd of December 1761 and May 1762. Hmm. It charged the Jesuits with holding to, quote, a doctrine authorizing theft, lying, perjury, impurity, every passion and crime, teaching homicide, parricide and regicide, overthrowing religion in order to substitute for it superstition by favoring sorcery, blasphemy, irreligion, and idolatry. Unquote. Shall I read that again, dear listener, that you understand every little word? The statements and teachings of the Jesuits were collected and presented to the King of France in a document which reads, the Jesuits are charged with holding to, quote, a doctrine authorizing theft, authorizing lying, authorizing perjury, impurity, authorizing every passion and crime, teaching homicide, parricide, and regicide, 
overthrowing religion in order to substitute it for superstition, which is Roman Catholicism, by favoring sorcery, blasphemy, irreligion and idolatry. Brett, didn't you speak of sorcery when you read Revelation chapter 18, verse 23, half I an sure hour did. ago? Oh, yes, absolutely. And here it comes again. Mm -hmm. The Jesuits are charged with holding by favoring sorcery, blasphemy, irreligion, and idolatry. What does the Bible speak about here? The Jesuit order. Yes. So this is no conspiracy theory. We are no Jesuit haters, but we prove that the Jesuit order is satanic to its core by the Bible. Mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 18, verse 23. Read it for yourself. The above quote, as I just read to you, taken from... <laughs> From Helena Petrova Blavatsky, Isis Unveiled, corresponds exactly with extracts from a work which appeared in Paris in 1762, known as Extra des Assertions des Jésuites, means excerpts from the assertions of the Jesuits. These assertions were published by order of the French Parliament, and the facts, I am informed, can be independently verified by a visit to a British mu to the British Museum and the Bodleian Library. Two editions of the Extra des uh, Assertations were published by P. G. Simon in Paris in 1762 in four volumes. The title page of the work states that it is a collection of quote, dangerous and pernicious unquote, teachings and precepts taught by the Jesuits with approbation of their superior. Means the approbation with the content, with the order of their superior, under the order of their superior. The government lawyers who examined the documents, the Breton Le Châtelet in particular, discovered the constitutions a handbook of every known form of heresy, idolatry and superstition. It provides, he said, tutelage in suicide, legicide, means the destruction of laws, and every kind of impurity, usury, sorcery, murder, cruelty, hatred, vendetta, insurrection and treason. Thus were the Jesuits confounded tanta nube testium by such a cloud of witnesses. Their own constitutions without any need to rely on the secreta moneta. And yet, the Jesuits say that the constitutions are an inspiration of the Holy Spirit. What Holy Spirit has inspired the Jesuit order? is not the Holy Spirit that we think of as Bible-believing Christians when we think and speak of the Holy Spirit. Now we have almost reached an hour and I will complete the reading here for today on the top of page 31, uh, but I think that Brett probably has to make some comments on what I've just read. My oh my, it's, uh, you know, sometimes when you read these types of books it just takes a while to... Uh, to let that sink in and 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 kind of um, let it work into your worldview and what you know in your own heart, you know. I mean, these things are, um, you know, the doctrines of the Jesuits are very very dangerous, and of course, they're kept secret for good reason because if the people really did know. The implications had time to think about uh, the doctrine. Uh, it would be uh, very, very well thought to uh, get rid of it by, uh, I think, the vast majority of common people. What do you think, Jörg? I, I mean, think obviously it was in the, in the history because they abolished their presence in Europe for a while. But go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, no, don't be sorry. I, I think that you are absolutely correct, but we have to take into consideration one thing. We are speaking about the time of 1760, 1761, yeah. 1762, okay? Right. That is the time 
when who was the superior general of the Jesuits at that time, Brad? Oh boy, I'd have to look it up. Really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'd have to look it up. I don't Lorenzo know. Ricci. Ah, okay. Yes. That's right, because of the Illuminati. That's right. I should know these. He things. became he became Jesuit general in seventeen fifty eight. Mm-hmm. And all his ministry, all his working in the times that he was general of the Society of Jesus was working for one purpose only. The exposing of the Jesuit order to the public. By that that the people thought when they were abolished, they were abolished forever. And when Pope Clement XIV in 1773 abolished the Jesuits with issuing the papal bull Dominic Ac Redemptor, the Jesuits vanished from the face of the earth for the public. Now, when you see that this trial was done in 1761, 1762, that is the precursor. In France, the Jesuits were exposed. France was one of the leading countries of Europe at that time. When the Jesuits were exposed there, after that came the expulsion of the Jesuit order of France, of Spain, of Portugal, of Germany, of Italy, of other countries. They were all expelled. Then they were forbidden by the Pope. And the people thought, the Jesuits are gone. What did they do then? <laughs> yeah, they founded the United States of America through a revolutionary war that actually was a religious war, that was a counter-reformational war, because it was a war against the Protestants assembling in the colonies to get them separate from the United Kingdom. You have to see the bigger picture. This is all a precursor of the Jesuits being exposed in 1773, so well exposed that even the Pope said, we cannot keep that order anymore, we have to abolish it. And he did it with the papal bull. And they went underground. And between 1773 and 1814, they dealt in the underground. And when they came up in 1814 again, what was the next thing they did? In 1814, the secret treaty of Verona. And of Chiri a little bit later, and of Vienna in 1815. You know? Mm. This is how you have to understand history. When we read here by P.D. Stewart that the Jesuits were exposed to the French public by having to make public their constitutions... They were exposed to the public in all their doings and all the words that we've just uh, that we've just read, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Tutelage and suicide, legicide, every kind of impurity, usury, sorcery, murder, cruelty, hatred, vendetta, insurrection, and trees. Nobody wants to have uh, somebody in his country to deal with that. So okay, forbid them. That was Lorenzo Ricci's bidding from the beginning to take care of, that the Jesuits are exposed in the open, that people turn away in awe from that, and that they will not agree with the Jesuits being alive anymore, and then the Pope, as the highest authority, forbids the Jesuit order, and hey, all is well. And Revelation 13 came into pass. I saw one of his heads as it was wounded to death. This is how you have to understand this book. You have to read Cold World, Babylon, Rulers of Evil, The Ark and the Dove, and many other books. And then understand what you have read and learn to read between the lines and put the pieces together. And all of a sudden, before your eyes will form a puzzle that you put every little piece in there and the farther you go away, the more you will see the completion of a picture that will lead you to see the face of Satan, because that's what it's all about. Discovering the Antichrist. Not the vicar of the Antichrist, the Pope of Rome, but the real Antichrist. Satan, the devil, the serpent, the dragon.
Well, Brett, you can do a mm. little closure. I close right here and uh, leave for you the closing remarks of this broadcast of today. I thank everybody for watching and listening. I enjoyed this very much and uh, I want to ask you to forgive me if my pronunciation of not every word was correct here. I did not read these pages in advance. It is more than half a year, I think even more than a year ago that I read this book or the parts of this book. I didn't prepare anything, so I hope that you can go along with me and accept the way that I read this book and I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned and I hope that I can set you up to do your own research. Until next time, Jörg from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth, signing off and bye-bye. Yes, thank you so much, Jörg, for your reading and discussion of this book as we are working into the the more difficult aspects of history and the hidden hand that runs our governments today, still today, 500 years into the creation of the Jesuit order. And we find our presidents and politicians uh, deeply involved with this. And there is no excuse as far as a born-again Bible believer goes. Uh, you, you need to know that, um, well, that we're, you know, dealing with some very difficult uh, situations, but uh, the Lord is calling us out in his wonderful Bible, and we can read the book of Revelation, which is a very powerful and relevant book today. And I just want to thank Yerk and also thank all of you out there that are subscribed and all of you that have influenced uh, the study and the um, purification, really, of our own walk with Christ in reading the Bible and um, and looking into the, the more uh, difficult lessons in life. And certainly we can learn a lot from those lessons, and that works through the Bible. You know, the Lord has a way of working with our hearts when we submit to Him. So in His Spirit, I close the session for today and I thank Yerk and I thank you listeners and I'm looking very much forward to the next one so in Jesus Christ's glorious name I ask for uh, blessings and uh, peace to everyone and we'll talk soon thanks bye bye